despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. All of my fear I will turn into into praise. Disappointment 
there's someone in the house that can lift up their hands and give God a praise and a shout. I don't know if there's someone in the house that can witness that he has broken through. He's broken through for me. He's broken through for my family. He's broken through into my marriage. He's broken. He is the God of the breakthrough. He is the God of the breakthrough. There is no obstacle too hard. There is no sickness too far. There is no sin too deep that God cannot break into and break you out of. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. Oh, it feels good in the house this evening. It feels good in the house this evening. God is breaking through and He is doing wonderful things here in the Pentecostals of the land. Let me tell you, this morning, Pastor taught a great message on tithing. Everybody smile for me. And you want to know what God did during the service? Not only did he inst- did God through his word instruct us and build our faith, but God also filled three people with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Two souls made the decision to be baptized in Jesus' name. He is the God of the breakthrough. And I, I want to thank every single one of you who week in, week out are constantly serving from the Sunday school department, from the U team, from the hyphen, the music, our ushers, everyone that is involved. I want to thank you for the service that you give, for the time that you give. But more than that, I want to thank you for the faith that you bring. Thank you for the faith that you bring into the house of worship. Week in, week out, you come in believing with us that God can make a difference in someone's life. Week in, week out, you come in praying that God would pour out of His Spirit. And God does it. He does it. And I want to thank you for your faith, for your prayers, for your consecration, for your dedication to the kingdom of God. Why don't you look at someone that's right next to you and tell them, it's so good to see you this evening. We're glad that you've come to worship here at the Pentecostals of the land. Before we go into our second song of worship, I just want to share three announcements Um, Just three announcements to share with you. Uh, Next Sunday, everyone say next Sunday. We're not having an evening service, so so just put that in your calendar. Uh, Spend some time with your family and friends and and have, have a good time of fellowship where you can. The following Sunday after that, we're having our launch service. We're excited about that. We want everyone to be here in this building. Our Sunday school teachers, all of our kids are going to be in this building. So I want to encourage you to arrive early if you want to find a seat. Because this place is going to get packed out. Um, I believe it. It's going to be very difficult to find a seat if you come in a little late. So uh, please do show up early. Uh, The Wednesday leading up to this uh, launch service, we're having an all-church prayer meeting dedicated uh, to this service and to the campaign that's going to be launched. So we want to invite you as well to those midweek services and specifically September 4th. It's going to be a special time. We're going to be gathered here, united in prayer. So if you would all just put that in your calendar and and make it a priority to be here, we would love to see you. We want to partner together in what God is doing here at the POD. Amen. Amen. Well, if anyone has a need in this building, we want to pray for you. We want to make room for for God to reach you where you are. I know there's people that have come and have visited today, and we want to encourage you as well. If you have a need in your life, we can just lift, lift up those needs in prayer. We believe in a God who answers prayer. We believe in a God who, when we lift up his name, he comes down, he visits us, he can lose healing and miracles, he can do the impossible. So if we can't 
man, why don't we all stand just one more time as we enter the second time of worship and let's lift up our hands. Let's lift up our hearts as well before the Lord. And what, if you could just join with me in prayer just for a moment and let's ask the Lord to fill this place with his presence. Lord, we've come to worship you this evening, Lord. I pray, God, that you would do something marvelous in our life tonight, Lord. I pray that there would be liberty in this house, God, to worship and to praise your name, Lord. I pray, God, that you would move, Lord, from this, from one side of the sanctuary to the other, God, that there wouldn't be a place or a soul in this house that wouldn't feel your glory and wouldn't feel your presence, Lord. I pray, Jesus, that you would saturate this house with your glory. I pray, Jesus, Lord, that you would touch us this evening, Lord. We need you, God. We need you, Jesus, to move in this house. We need you, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name.
Let's just ask the Lord. He reigns. Let's tell the Lord. Let it be a declaration in your own life. He reigns in my life. He reigns here in the land. He reigns in my marriage and in my family. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, you still sit in that throne, God. You're still in control, Lord. Lord, you reign. You are Lord over all, God. You're Lord over all, Jesus. Lord, we trust you in all your ways, God. Lord, we commit our thoughts and our ways to you. And we trust you with all of our heart, God. Oh, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Feels good in the house of the Lord if we can make our way back to our seats. This evening is, is a wonderful evening. We have a, a, a treat. We have a we are blessed to have first and foremost Sister Bianca with us. Um, for those of you who do not know, she is a missionary to the country of Spain, and um, she has she left earlier this year and she came back just to be with uh, Fred and Dee who had their baby, and we're just glad that that she's here and we're able to see her. Um, and I know she'll be returning shortly back, but but we'll miss her as always. Um, but tonight we're we're not gonna hear from her, and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we actually might hear from her in September, so that'll be good. Um, but tonight we get to hear from Brother Derek McGee. A amen. Yeah. He, he has served faithfully with Pastor Brett uh, at Redeemed for years, him and Aisha. And I know they are a tremendous blessing uh, personally to Pastor Brett and Kara. Um, and all the assistance that they do. And I know Redeemed, the congregation as a whole, is blessed to have the both of them. They are wonderful, wonderful ministers. And, and I know anyone planting a church would love to have a Derek and Aisha right next to them serving. So why, why don't we honor them? Because they, they are, we do love the both of you guys. And you guys are so valuable, so valuable. But why don't we welcome Brother Derek McGee up to this pulpit. And he's going to be preaching the word tonight. Hello, church. <laughs> it is such a, a privilege and honor to be able to be before you guys. And I, I definitely don't take it lightly uh, being up there. There's so many people that know more than, than I do in reality. There's so many people that are, are far more experienced and have 
vast more wisdom than I could ever even muster up, but it, it's very humbling if that makes any sense. It's very humbling that I'm here before you guys tonight. And I believe God has got amazing things in store for this church. We've already been feeling it within the atmosphere. God has been moving. God has been shifting. And I believe God is going to take us to a greater place. He's going he's gonna to move, but he's also going to instruct. He's going to teach and he's going to show us some things that I believe is for the betterment of this church. If you're in agreement, say amen with me. Okay, okay. And, oh, I, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be normal if I didn't embarrass my wife a little bit, but I just wanted to say how much I, I love her, and she's had to bear with uh, the last few weeks of me going over what God has been dealing with me uh, as to, to what I want to present with you guys today, and she's probably heard this message probably 40, 50 times, but I thank you for being here as well, and, and, and bearing through it, I, I believe God's got some in store for you as well, and including me, and, uh, and I'd also be amiss to not... Uh, give respect and honor to, to our pastor. He, he's shepherded us and he shepherded me and he, he's helped us and, and Pastor Brett as well. He's also my pastor. It's kind of weird to kind of work out that dichotomy between the, the two, but they're both my pastors and they both have had amazing roles in my life. And thank Jimmy for, for always, you know, kind of kind of being there for his, me as well and being a voice of instruction and help in time of need. It, oh, I don't, I don't take it lightly. Um, quickly pull up my notes here real quick. So I'm going to go ahead and start with Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 through 3. For those that have the word of God, let's stand. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind the brokenhearted. Next verse. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that they that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. I know we've already prayed, but I'm going to have us pray one more time. I know the, the word of God is anointed and we didn't need no help in that department, but God is wanting to bring forth a word for this church. And I pray that it come out clearly. I pray that nothing more and nothing less be brought forth. So in agreement together, help me pray, church. God, we thank you for what you've been doing. We thank you for what we've been feeling within your presence, for pricking our hearts, for leading us us, for directing us. We know that you've got a word from heaven for us to hear. God, let our hearts be sensitive, our hearts ready to receive what you want to bring forth. God, let us hear your words. God, let us hear your instruction. God, we need you to move. God, let us get out of the way. God, let me get out of the way so that we can see, so that we can hear, and we can be moved and instructed by you and your leading. God, we both believe you for it, God, and we receive it in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And I'm making sure not to forget, everybody can be seated. My wife made me memorize that. So church, no matter where we end up in, in life and no matter what comes our way, no matter what up is up against us, we have a confidence, and I know we know this, that that God is right there beside us. He's never going to forsake us. He's never going to leave us, church. And I truthfully, I put my trust in that. And I believe in a God that loves us so much that the vastness of his love cannot be contained. It cannot be measured. It cannot be quantified. His love robed himself in flesh. He walked amongst us, died the death we deserve and rose so that we can one day be with him forever and ever in heaven, to be with him in eternity. Until that day, though, he has got a calling for every single person in this building. And I believe those here today have already answered the call and are amongst the chosen. 
You're calling God and I'm responding. Whatever you say, thus saith the Lord and I am going to do it. In Jesus' name. You might be asking, what is this calling you're referring to? This is going to be a little bit of an, a, a different one, but I'm going to elaborate on that. I believe God is calling us to be like a tree of righteousness. So if I was to go ahead and title this sermon, it would be a righteous tree. A righteous tree. And you might be asking, what are you referring to to be this tree of righteousness? Others may be thinking, why a tree? That sounds kind of boring. Why not a pinata or a parade of righteousness? Something a little more exciting and something that has a little bit more pizzazz. But all jokes aside, this is one of the greatest things you could, could be called to attain and one of the greatest things that you can become. First off, when thinking of a tree, one might look at it and, and say, this, this, this tree, it's sturdy. Something that has roots in the ground and something that over time grows to be thicker, it grows to be stronger, and over time it produces deeper roots. Proverbs 12, verse 3 says, A man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of righteous, the righteous, shall not be moved. And that word established there in the Hebrew is kun, meaning fixed, secure, prepared, settled, and steadfast. A man shall not be fixed and secured and prepared and settled by wickedness, things in this world. But the root of the righteous shall not be moved. You see, when the righteous have roots in the ground, they're not easily moved. They're not easily pulled up. At times we may be shaken, but we are settled. We are steadfast. We are fixed and prepared for what lies ahead. We have a truth being found in Jesus. We've got a foundation in Jesus being our chief cornerstone that we can hang our hat on, that we can stand firmly, fixed and unmovable by what comes against us, not to be easily toppled by the cares of this life and the perverse nature of this world. For the world may be trying to shake us, but by God, it's not going to break us. There is so much perverse doctrine floating within this world and even within Christendom. And we need to be grounded, church. We need to be fixed, placed within the word of God and his authority. For it is the spoken word of God. If it's within the word of God, that is what I want to be deeply rooted in. Whatever the Lord has said, I want to have my feet deeply planted in that truth that will never fade and fail when this world will. For Psalms 1 chapter 1 verse 1 through 4 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. In the law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in season. And his leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper." But the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff with the wind driveth away. Church, I don't want to have shallow roots where things are easily able to pluck me up. Every little thing with no substance or strength being able to move me. Something lacking conviction, purpose, and reason. But like that tree, I want to send my roots near the stream in the source of life, liberty, and love. I want my roots in Jesus. I want to be close to that living water, the source of my life, the source of truth that no matter what I face, no matter what I go through, that I have exactly exactly what I need found within him not outside of the word of God not outside of our understanding of well it may be beyond our understanding but not outside of God we don't have to go to any substance we don't have to go to anything our answer is in God not in any guru or anything that tries to exalt itself higher God knows best his word speaks truth and we can be sure that it will not fade, it will not fail, and it will continue to be what we need it to be. And that is truth in a world that has no truth, it seems like. 
Every, everybody's truth is their own truth. What truth is there but what God has given? Jesus, you're the source of my strength. You're my stability and my foundation. And if you're for us, who can be against us? Lord, you are bigger than all and you are working within all and you create it all. Our hope, our trust, and our faith is in your word and your leading and your Holy Spirit. When we look at, I know it's going to seem like a segue. I'm I'm putting a whole bunch of things out there, but I believe it's going to come together in the end. You see, Jonah, he had a mandate from the Lord to go to Nineveh. Where, uh, were not, and, and who were not his people and warned them of the impending wrath for their, was sin, for their sin and ways. However, Jonah did not want to go through. The Ninevite people were those that were wicked and did everything opposite as to one could do in relation to the word of God. The Lord's word was pure and holy, yet the people of Nineveh were, were vile and they were perverse. The culture in their time was so immoral and terrifying. They practiced temple prostitution, child sacrifice, abortion, and they would remove the noses. This is weird. The noses and the ears of their prisoners to mark and maim them for life. I don't, you know, I, I don't blame Jonah. I'd be kind of nervous too if I might lose a nose, I might lose an ear. That sounds pretty crazy and that seems pretty vicious. And most of us here know how this story goes, knowing this, that Jonah tried to outrun the word of God by sailing in the complete opposite direction as to where he needed to be. He was put through a storm affecting those on board with him, and he eventually was hurled overboard into the sea and swallowed by a big fish. And after all that happened, you would think Jonah would have learned his lesson by the end of the story. After being what was described to be like hell for three days and three nights. Then by the mercy of God spit out onto dry land. Did the task, warned the people. Then they repented. They fasted. They prayed unto God in a unified effort. With all humility and the Lord spared them. The Lord spared them, yet Jonah was wroth. He was angry. He was mad. Why? Why would you save these people? Well, the Lord spared the people that he said he was going to destroy. And out of Jonah's mouth, in Jonah chapter 4, verse 2 says, That is why I ran to Tarshish. I knew you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. And that is why, and that is why he was mad, for he knew the word of the Lord. He knew, the, the, he knew God's nature, seeming to have deep roots of understanding. Yet when push came to shove, his roots were not as deep as he may have thought. For if he had healthy roots, strong roots, one that was connected to the source, he would have had some fruit within this story. You see, an understanding of truth, yet no fruit, no mercy, no compassion for what was not even his creation. Where was his love? Where was his mercy? And where was his righteousness? This is a truth, and this is a truth that I want us to receive I don't want to bite the bullet, but the truth that we want to receive is even if we have a vast amount of biblical knowledge, understanding of the Word of God, even if we we know it backwards and forward, even if we have a theologic degree, even though we have all this understanding, if we lack certain things that God is wanting us to produce, certain acts of righteousness, certain acts of love, the reality is it is in vain. What we do is in vain when we lack that compassion. Instead, there was self-righteousness that was found within Jonah. Haughtiness, privilege, and there was pride. For they were not even his creation. God had made them, and he's trying to tell God what he's going to do with his creation, failing to show mercy and love because of these people's wickedness. And this brings us to point two of this tree of righteousness. And that being what makes the tree righteous. The answer is in the fruit. 
We do need to be strong. We do need to be unmovable. We do need to know the word of God. We need to have strong doctrine and know what we know and be able to answer when people ask us questions. But this tree needs fruit. This tree needs fruit. Matthew chapter 6 verse 30 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We use that scripture all the time for good reason. It's important. We need to seek the kingdom of God first in all that we do because when we do, what we need will be provided. We don't have to worry about our needs, but sometimes we fail to realize the other part of that passage. We neglect the other part, and that other part is and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What do you mean by that? For church, the kingdom of God is an unseen kingdom. By the natural eyes, we cannot see it. It is invisible. Luke 17, verse 20 through 21 says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, this is Jesus, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God not cometh with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Knowing this, how could we How could someone see the kingdom of God then in the world that we live? The answer is within righteousness. For if we are truly seeking his kingdom first, we will also be seeking his righteousness. And what is able to be seen to the natural eye. This being through the believer's life, being his fruit, being evidence of the kingdom of God at work within our life. For we're told by Jesus that you will know those that labor among you by their fruit, seeking the unseen and the seen. That is the balance. We need to seek first the kingdom of God, but we also need to allow God to work and to produce some fruit, something righteous within us that others can see for them to be able to see the kingdom of God within our lives. I'm all for miracles. I'm all for healings. I'm all for these greater things of God, but they need to see some fruit within our lives. They need to see something different amongst us. We're not like the world. There is something tangible. There is something you can see. There is something that you can taste. And that is the Lord's fruit. Taste and see for the Lord is good. And you're going to know he's good by the way I'm living my life and what he's producing. In the name of Jesus. Proverbs Chapter 11, verse 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. Proverbs 12, verse 12 says, The wicked desireth the net of evil men, but the root of the righteous yieldeth yieldeth fruit. There it is again. We need this fruit. Our fruit shows and it reflects to others God's righteousness within our lives. As we grow, we should be producing fruit. For what is immature will and cannot grow past self and its own needs. However, for those producing godly fruit in their lives, it shows that God is producing something within us. And we're able to reflect to this lost world the source of light. We're able to reflect to the world this this righteousness that doesn't come from us, but it comes from God. We are reflecting His nature, being an image bearer of that which created us. Being an image bearer of that which created us. Am I going too fast, church? Okay. For the believer, he has placed his roots deeply into the word of God. His ways are truth, and over time, they develop this fruit. We all know it in Galatians chapter 5, being love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I would be under the strong persuasion that like Paul teaches, without love, This Greek word agape love working within our lives, everything else is in vain. And that these fruit that reflect and come from his righteousness also reflect and stem from his never-ending failing love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that through him 
we should live and not perish through him, we can find eternal life. This agape love, God, he, he, he exemplified it. He showed us how to live. He showed us how to be. And he showed us what we need to do. Paul also references this, this righteousness when we're looking at the, the armor of God. There's a breastplate of righteousness. We find it in, in Ephesians, I believe, chapter 6. But we also see, and I believe 1 Thessalonians, Paul also addressed this, this, breast, this breastplate of love and faith. When you look between the two, you could be like, well, maybe he's talking about a different breastplate. Maybe he's talking about something different. But I would be under the strong persuasion that there's not much there given to point in the opposite direction. He doesn't, he doesn't state that this is any other breastplate, but this, this is the breastplate of faith and love, and this is the breastplate of righteousness, what, what, what are you trying to get from this preacher? What I'm trying to get at is the breastplate of righteousness is the same thing as the breastplate of faith and love. How, do, how does that make sense? Well, I've got my faith in God, the creator of, of everything. I've got my relationship with God. It is vertical. It is up and down. But when I have a, the love of God working within my life, I'm able to exemplify this agape love, this selfless love, this unmerited love, this unfailing love. God is able to impart and work it within me, and I'm able to love others as God intended, to love others selflessly, to love others in a way where we're seeking nothing in return. It is a selfless love, not a selfish love. So we've got our, our vertical relationship with God, and we've got our horizontal relationship with each other. And what do you find at the precipice, at the, at the middle of that? You find the righteousness of God. Jesus was hung on a cross being that very righteousness so that we could have a relationship with the creator and that we could exemplify this exact same love for each other. It's not anything that I, I, I can muster up or do on my own because inherently it's not always easy to love those that seem to be unlovable, those that have hurt us, those that that seem to, they keep getting in this mistake. They keep getting, they keep doing things and, and they might deserve it. But the love of God is merciful. The love of God is forgiving and we're able to look past and to love them despite where they are at. We don't condone sin. We don't love sin. We hate sin, but we love the believer with this agape, selfless love. And if still not convinced, Jesus, when illustrating the end of the final judgment within Matthew 25, verse 31 through 46, states that the righteous obtaining eternal life were those that did unto the least of men, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, feeding the hungry. What they have done unto them, they have done unto God. Loving his people and loving his creation that were made in his image. The word agape love can be defined as pure, willful, sacrificial love. That intentionality desires another highest good, a selfless love. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And in Matthew 5 verse 20 says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. That is a scary thing to hear. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. We can't be like Jonah. We can't be like the Pharisees. We cannot be like the Sadducees who had an understanding of the word of God. But upon closer inspection, they lacked something so great. And that was compassion. That was mercy. That was love for others. They couldn't see past themselves in their own relationship with God. They weren't able to help anybody else and take them along the journey. They were so fixated 
on self and what they thought was right at the time. For us to eventually go up into heaven, we must now move down, moving from selfishness, from selfishness to selflessness. And I don't believe we, we struggle with that in this church, but I felt very strongly, and this is even convicting to myself, that God is wanting to expand our love. God is wanting to grow our love so that we can love those out in the community, that we can greater love each other within unity, that we can seek after peace and be brought together in such a way that that no man is able to put asunder because God has brought us together. There is this love, there is this peace that is, is, is gluing us together and we're not going anywhere for we're together. And for those that are out in that are lost, I don't want to forget about them. I don't want to look down on them. I don't want to dismiss them, but I want to love them and I want to help them in any way that I can. For God will help us. He will show us how we can better help people that are in need. We may not have always the resources or the ability, but God, with what he has given us, he will allow us and he will show us what we need to do within that time. For how can we say we love a God who we can't see yet fail to love what is right in front of us? Our brother, our sister, and our neighbor. Jesus says this harsh reality that you can't. You doing so, you would, you would lie for it is impossible. For you will know a tree by its fruit or its lack thereof. If you love God with everything within you, even when not easy, you would choose to love his creation. This love is a choice. God, I'm going to allow you to produce this love within me. And you would choose to allow God to help you within this endeavor. For you cannot neglect the people and children of God and remain in right standing with the Creator. In Jonah 4.10, Jesus is uh, talking to, God is talking to Jonah and he says, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into to being in a night, and it perished in a night. You should, and, and should you not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there was more than 120,000 people who did not know their right hand from the left, and also much cattle, no love, no mercy, no patience, and no kindness, no goodness, and no gentleness, there was no fruit. Where was the righteousness? Where was the righteousness? Everybody's, everybody here is, is more than likely familiar with this story, but I, I felt strongly to present it, and that is that there was a, a man, he was walking from Jerusalem to, to, to Jericho, and he was, he was beaten, he was attacked by, by robbers, and they left him for dead. He was almost dead, he was, he was, on, he was on the ground, and there was... Um, there was a, a priest that had walked past this man that was harshly beaten, and he saw this man. He saw how he was struggling. He saw where he was at, but he decided to, to look the other way and to continue walking. Then you see a, a Levite come into this, the story. He, he, w- he was walking along this path, and he also saw the man that was harshly beaten, this man that had great need, this man that needed someone to help them. Yet he turned the other way and he kept walking. Yet there was this Samaritan man. The Samaritans, they were, they were, hated, by, they were hated by the Jews and of that of the religious sect of the time. This Samaritan man decided to show the love and mercy of God. He stooped down to that man and he began to pour on him oil and, 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 and wine and cleansed the man, and, and cleaned out his sores, and he, he put him on his donkey, and he brought him back to his inn that he paid for, and he took care of the man. Why are you telling us this story? It's because we need to be just like that. This story was brought forth because the, the, the religious folk were asking Jesus, who is my neighbor, trying to, trying to figure this out, trying to trap him. Who is my neighbor? Those that are beside you, those that have great need, those that are struggling, barely able to continue, those that seem like they don't have much to offer, much to give, they're, 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 they're broken. 
That is my neighbor. Everybody got places within our vicinity. Everyone got places within our sphere that we see when we go to work, when we go to school, when we go about our day to day. That is our neighbor. And how we respond to our neighbor is of the utmost importance. They need to see the love of God operating in our lives. We need to pray for them, not look down on them. We need to seek out their needs. If we see a homeless person on the side of the road, this is convicting to me because sometimes I'm like, they're just going to buy drugs. They've lied to me before. They're going to lie to me again. But those that are poor, those that are needy, those that don't have anything, if God has given you something to give, if God is the more, more that God has given you, the more that is required. Church, the more God gives us, the more that is required. We need to help people with what God has given us. It is not our own. We are on borrowed time, and what God gives us is borrowed. And at times, he, not at times, he wants us to continually seek after those that have needs, those that have issues, those that aren't able to provide. And if we're able in an area to do so, I am not perfect in this. I am not perfect in this. But if my brother offends me, if someone offends me and and does me wrong, then I'm to seek peace with them, even if I'm wrong. Even, not if, not, well, I misspoke. I might be wrong. Usually I'm, I'm wrong a lot. Ask my wife. I completely flipped that. Even if they are wrong. Even if you have every reason to be upset, I am going to die on this hill. I am justified for being angry. I'm justified for holding on to what I'm holding on to. It doesn't matter. God still wants us to seek peace with our brethren. God still wants us to seek peace of those that are amongst us, even if they've done us wrong. And Jesus even took it even further than me. He was a little more radical, but I'll bring it forth too. If someone is trying to sue you in court, taking your tunic, give them your cloak also. I can't do that in the, with the natural man. I can't do that with my own understanding. But whatever it takes, I'm going to seek peace with all men. Trusting that God will provide. Trusting that God will bring forth the answer, even if it seems like they're getting away with it. God will help you, but you need to do what is right. I need to do what is right within those moments. We need to be faithful in all that we do. We need to be joyous with the days that we've got, not in the days that are around us, but we need to be joyous in God. We need to be joyous. We need to exhibit this fruit. We need to be loving. I know, church, it seems like I'm all over the place. Please forgive me. Okay. You might be asking, how, how, how am I able to do this? It seems impossible. It goes against my reasoning. It goes against my natural inclinations. It goes against this, this humanity, humanity that, that seeks to save itself, that is self-preservating. What can I do? Well, John 15, verse 4 through 5 says, Abide in me. This is the key. And I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. For I am the vine, ye are the branches, and he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. And that is the answer to how. It's got to be through him. We've got to continue to remain in Jesus and in him and him in us via his Holy Spirit. For he lays the seed of change within our hearts and inward man to eventually grow and to produce outward character and traits found only through God. 
For they are not our own with this fallen humanity. For without them there is no true fruit. And without them there is no true change. Everything attempting to be produced by self, strength, and will will eventually fall. It will eventually falter and it will eventually die and prove to be nothing but a cheap knockoff of the real deal. What looks to be good on the outside, yet dead on the inside. And that's, 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 that's the thing. You might even be asking, I see, other people, I see other people producing fruit, these things that seem good. I see some kind people, some good people, some gracious people, some people that are faithful. What's the difference? The difference is it's by their strength and it's by what they're able to muster up, but they're human. They're going to go through tough times. They're going to go through difficulties. And upon close inspection and upon enough time, you'll realize that it may have looked good on the outside, but it was sour. It was dead on the inside. And it didn't lack sustenance for when things got difficult, when things got hard, their fruit perished and their fruit died for it was not connected to the true source it was not godly fruit and it was not of his love going down to verse 8 of john 15 by this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples Mirroring John 13, 35, by this everybody will know that you're my disciples by your love towards one another. To follow Jesus, we must take up our crosses daily. We must deny ourselves and like Jesus says, say no, uh, Jesus says no greater love than a man who laid down his life for others. And 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And, and, <laughs> and this last one that, that stirs me to no end is not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, you workers of lawlessness. I don't want to be to that place. I don't want to come to a place where I get so focused on what I'm doing within the church, where I get so focused on my life and what's going on that I fail to love my brother, that I fail to love my sister, and that I fail to love my neighbor in the way that God desires. God, help us do what we can on our own. God, give us the capacity and the ability to love those who you have called us to love. Bring up the roots of hurt and bitter fruit, Lord. Heal the ground of our hearts and place your love within us. Let your word bring forth life and let it produce righteous fruit. I don't want to waste what you've given to me, God. Let not my life, let not what I've done be in vain. Let my praise and worship, God, let it not be in vain. But let your spirit breathe fresh life within me today, church. Let us decrease. Let us esteem others greater. Let us not look down on others, but let us look at our neighbor with respect, with dignity, with care for our brothers and sisters in Christ, looking at them with a sense of admiration. Someone we can, we can, we can look up to, learn from, help and encourage versus becoming jealous, bitter, or even vicious towards. Marcus preached it weeks back that Cain must go in that desire desire to kill our brother must die. I'm going to encourage my brother and sister. I'm going to speak a word of life to them. I'm going to build them up and not tear them down. I'm going to celebrate with my brother when he's doing good for a gentle tongue is a tree of life. For a gentle tongue is a, is a, is a tree of life. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 4 says, and if the musicians could make their way up. Yaraki Oroko 
The fruit of God is, is for others. As God's love wants to reach others and for others to be drawn unto Him. Not just having, like I said, this theological and doctrinal knowledge which is good, but alone without love, without God's love working within it, it is in vain for there needs to be a product in lo- of, of, of a work of love, mercy, and justice. And this justice is not ours, but it's His reflecting the Creator. Jonah and the Pharisees in in Jesus' day could not produce, lacking the heartbeat and nature of God. I'm going to exclude Jonah. He wasn't in Jesus' day. I worded that kind of weird. But at that time, we may question God. You are saving, using, and washing away even their sins, the dirty, those who may be called unforgivable. God, don't you know what they did? Don't you know what they said? The hurting. The broken, the addicted, the outcasts, the deadbeats, and those that are poor on this side of eternity, you want to save them? The answer is yes. Remember, hurting people hurt people. And I'm not justifying behavior, but when that comes our way, we need the God, we need the strength of God to not reason within our humanity and justify our actions, but through God's divinity. In his love, we are able to produce this fruit that others are able to see and taste for he is good, for they need to see God through our fruit, through his fruit reflecting his nature and his love. So in the end, to bring it all together, what makes a tree righteous? Well, for the believer, it's to be immovable, unshakable, sturdy, being deeply rooted in in an unchanging truth that's never going to go anywhere. Heaven and earth may pass away, but his word will remain. When everything seems to be falling apart, there will be a beacon of hope found within you. Jesus has called us to be a beacon of hope, to be image bearers of the one we were made in the image of. He wants us to reflect his nature. He wants us to reflect his love. Why are they not buckling under the pressure, people might ask? Why are they still standing? Not just standing, but why are they standing strong? Are they not worried or are they afraid? For the answer to that is no, God has given us, has not given us the spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind that amongst no matter where we at, we've got this joy, we've got this strength, we've got this resilience that I am not going anywhere and people see that and they're drawn to that. Why is he so kind and good? Do, Do you not know what just happened to him? He's encountered death. People have ridiculed him. People have spit on him. Why is he being kind? Why is he being good? In those moments, they're going to see how we respond. Don't be fooled. People are listening to what we say under pressure. People are looking as to how we carry ourselves with heavy loads. Are we going to buckle under the pressure or are we going to realize that this is not just for me? But it's for those that are watching. It is for those that are gleaning that they need to see something that is different than what the world has tried to produce. To hear something that this world has not been able to produce that is only going to come through God. Church, we need to be that light. We need to be that voice in this hour. We need to have true fruit. That no matter what happens, I'm not going to justify my humanity. I'm not going to justify where I'm at. But I'm going to be who God has called me to be. And that is a sturdy tree that is going to produce fruit for not just me and my family, but for those that are able to come and grab the fruit. We need you, Jesus, in this hour. I don't want my love to wax cold. 
I don't want my love to wax cold. I need your light to continue to shine within me. I need you to continue to be what you are in my life so that that love can remain alive in my life and for those that need to see your love. I was feeling this song laid heavy on my heart. And it's something that I'm, I'm going to try to sing just a little bit for you guys because this is how we need to be in this hour, how we need to perceive people and how we need to react. I'm the man on the street holding a sign. I know what it says, but look in my eyes. than money I am a single mother of three I know how it looks but please don't condemn me I need you to reach me will you pray for me will you speak to me Perverse. 
heart versus those that don't. This being the love of God with the righteous gloom growing through it. The world's watching us. The world's watching how we respond. Yaraki ayaroko. Oh.